So three years ago, we had the great festival of World Youth Day taking place in Krakow in Poland. I know that some of you were there, and from that time, the student group, we had 25 students going from Newman House, a fantastic pilgrimage with the diocese. And look, we had very many happy and holy moments, and one or two quite amusing moments as well. One of them was on the Saturday evening at the prayer vigil service. Pope Francis was preaching. I think he was speaking in, in Spanish rather than Polish. And we all had these cheap radios that were given to us and earpieces like FBI agents trying to listen and tune in to the simultaneous translation so everyone could hear and understand. But of course it was really hard to hear and understand. And one moment someone said, what did he say? Someone else pressed their earpiece and they said, I think he's talking about the evils of the sofa. <laughs> and they said, what, the evils of the sophists? No, no, the, the evils of the sofa, the settee, the couch, the armchair. And he was. <laughs> Go and read the sermon. It's not that sofas in themselves are actually evil. We have three fine settees from Ikea down in the bar below. But Pope Francis famously said that you as young people need to step away from the sofa of comfort and convenience. He was warning the young people at World Youth Day against confusing happiness with consumption. Pope Francis said, Jesus is the Lord of risk, of the eternal more. Following Jesus demands a good dose of courage, a readiness to trade in the sofa for a pair of walking shoes and to set out on new and uncharted paths. It's a great message really for us at the beginning of term and I encourage you to look up that wonderful sermon and read it online. And here we are in today's reading from the prophet Amos, it must be one of the few places in the whole Bible where God himself tells us to get off our settees. I quote, Woe to you who are ensconced so snugly in Zion, and to those who feel so safe on the mountain of Samaria, who lie on ivory beds and stretch out on their divans, on their couches. Be careful how you read this. The prophet Amos criticises those who sit on sofas, those who eat lamb, those who sing with the harp, those who love the music of King David, those who drink wine, those who anoint themselves with oil. Are all these things evil? Not at all. And they can be the source of genuine human happiness and of divine blessing. But wait for the punchline. Amos says they have done all these things, but about the ruin of the tribe of Joseph they do not care at all. But about the ruin of the tribe of Joseph they do not care at all. That's the point. These are good things. Food, drink, music, IKEA furniture. But if they capture our hearts, if they become ends in themselves, then they can stop us seeing the bigger things that really matter. And above all, they can stop us seeing the needs of those around us. Self-care can turn into self-centeredness. A delight in good things can become self-indulgence. So the prophet Amos is saying, just raise your eyes, look, look outside yourselves, see that person sitting next to you in the lecture hall, the person in the registration queue at the library, the person eating alone in your student hall or kitchen, the person walking out of mass behind you today. Say hello to them, introduce yourself, ask them how they are. Step away from the smartphone just for 60 seconds. Take a risk. What have you got to lose? Last week was Freshers' Week. Let's call this week Talking to Strangers' Week. 
your openness to others, your simple kindness might be a ray of light that saves someone from despair or hopelessness, especially as they begin this uncertain year for many of them, and you might even make an unexpected friend. Now I know some of you are more shy than others. There are extroverts who find this easy, you have to hold them back a little bit. And there are introverts who find this hard. But if I'm sitting here and I say to myself, well, I'm shy, I can't do that. Do you see it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy? If I give myself the label shyness, that label becomes a barrier, a bubble, and it stops me doing very normal and wonderful things that actually I'm perfectly capable of doing. To have the label I'm shy on me is to wear an invisible crash helmet around my head with the frosted visor pulled firmly down over my eyes. You know that phrase, fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. It's a bit cheesy, but it contains a lot of truth. And in fact, it's no more than Aristotle's theory about the acquisition of virtue, repackaged for today's meme generation. <laughs> so don't be limited by the labels you have acquired or the stories you tell about yourself. Just for this week, try being an extrovert and see what happens after seven days. It's been great uh, in this light hearing about the work of the student outreach group over the last couple of weeks. You remember we met two weeks ago and we had four proposals just, just from the group. Well, they, These weren't my ideas. First, to go into the streets and hand out welcome cards and mass times to the, next, to the new students. And that's been going on all for the last fortnight, including this morning. Secondly, to have a film night, and we had a great evening on Wednesday with lots of visitors and first-timers. The third idea, to do a series of Instagram posts called Humans of Newman House, copying the famous Humans of New York site, with photographs of random people in the street and a snappy, cool quote from each person. The aim here, let's be frank, was to show that Catholic students in London are not crazy. <laughs> and that even they can be quite normal. But you can imagine the problems we had. We struggled to actually find any normal <laughs> Catholic students. So we had to compromise a bit, and, and three of them are sitting here in the congregation, so you'll have to tell me off afterwards. But anyway, we did our best to find the normal Catholic student who wouldn't scare other people on their Instagram feeds, and you can look on your Instagram feed and Facebook page um, after Mass to see how we've done. And the final outreach idea is, drum roll please, the first ever Newman House wine tasting event which takes place this Wednesday. We have four fabulous reds from across the globe and France Delmaum, one of our parishioners, is a professional wine guide. So she is going to talk us through these wonderful reds and teach us a little bit about the art of wine tasting. The idea you can see is that if we can't aspire to normality, then at least we can show the world we know how to party. <laughs> and of course, the wine is just an excuse to welcome people. And I mean that. I would love you to come, but please bring a friend who's never been here before. That's the point of these wonderful outreach events. The rich man in the Gospel today is doing his own wine tasting, but with a little warning. He's feasting magnificently every day. And when he dies, he goes to his torment in Hades, the poor man Lazarus is carried away to the angel, by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. It's a strange parable. The rich man is not condemned for his riches, but for not sharing them. It's the fact that he ignored someone who lay at his gate, 
This is the reference back to Amos. Lazarus is stricken with poverty, too sick to stand, too weak to keep even the dogs away from him. And every day, despite the physical nearness, the rich man keeps him at a distance. Do you see the poetic justice of the parable? Jesus is so clever. All his life, the rich man wanted to be in a different place from Lazarus. I don't want to be near you. To put a great separation between his own life and the life of Lazarus. And now that Lazarus lies in heaven in the bosom of Abraham, the rich man gets his wishes fulfilled. Aha! There is a great impassable gulf between them, fixed for all eternity. The gulf that just a few hours ago the rich man wanted. There's no talk of punishment in the parable. All his life the rich man was pushing Lazarus away and now he gets what he asked for. The rich man in effect has chosen his exile. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. If you want this year, this academic year, to be only about yourself, your achievements, your successes, your relationships, then it might just come true. Wonderful. But it's all about you. And you might find that by the end of the year or by the end of your three-year degree, you have come become trapped in yourself and in your own desires. Be careful what you wish for. But if you want this year to be, about, to be about other people as well, noticing them, looking out for them, delighting in them, giving time to them, then you will grow as well but in a different way. I was at a meeting with Cardinal Vincent last week and he said a beautiful thing. He said that when we suffer, it breaks open our heart and the space that is excavated out within our heart through suffering, that space becomes a place of welcome and refuge for others that wouldn't have been there without the suffering. Beautiful. But the same thing is true for generosity and stretching our hearts to be open to others, which does cost us something sometimes. It is, it can be, a self-sacrifice. Whenever you care for someone else, it creates a space in your heart, your heart expands By thinking less of yourself, you actually grow as a person because, some philosophy here, a person is defined not by their achievements, a robot can achieve so much, a person is defined by their ability to relate to others, by their love. You've probably heard the parable of the extra long chopsticks, right? Everyone knows it. I'm going to say it in case there's one person here who hasn't heard it before. A man is taken on a spiritual journey and he has a vision of hell and heaven. In hell, a table is set with a magnificent feast. Everyone has a pair of chopsticks, but they are four feet long. So they take the chopsticks, they pick up the delicious food and they try to turn the chopsticks back to their mouths but they're too long and the food won't fit into the mouth and it just falls onto the floor with the trying. Everyone in hell is dying of hunger and growing more and more angry. And then, you know where this is going, the spiritual pilgrim visits heaven. He sees the same banquet, the same chopsticks. But instead of trying to feed themselves, the people here in heaven pick up the food and reach across the table to feed the people opposite them. And the chopsticks are just the right length for that. In life, everyone has learnt the habit here of noticing the other person, 
of putting the other person first so that when they get to heaven it's second nature to look away from themselves and to look to the needs of others. They don't have to be taught this when they arrive. That's why in heaven everyone is happy. Okay, I know you need to study hard. You need to pass your exams. You need to eat well. You need to make your bed in the morning. I'm not telling you to pack up your studies and I'm not saying you have to join the missionaries of charity this afternoon. Your vocation at this moment is to be a good student and that involves a certain amount of focus on yourself and on your goals. That's okay and it's actually good and it's what God wants. But just remember, as you fulfil your duties and your dreams, that one part of your dream could be to make space for the other and that your life can only be fulfilled if you are able to help others find their fulfilment too.